Shane Beamer and the South Carolina Gamecocks are in the race for a bevy of blue chip prospects for the 2024 recruiting cycle, but there are a few specific guys that are can't miss prospects for this coaching staff. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock athletics. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast and also the lead staff writer for Gamecocks Digest over on SI.com. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen or watch here today. We are free and available on YouTube and also wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Before we get into this Friday edition of Locked On Gamecocks, I want to let you all know that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Obviously, in terms of recruiting right now, South Carolina's football program is in a little bit of a dead period because all of the National Signing Day periods for the 2023 cycle have come and gone. Obviously, prospects are not going to be able to make visits to some of these schools until spring practice really begins, which for the Gamecocks is going to be sometime in mid-March on a date that is to be determined. And obviously, we are a good ways away from the first slate of official visits taking place with multiple Gamecock targets. So for today's show, I kind of wanted to do a little bit of hypothetical talk here in terms of ranking sort of the top three guys that I think South Carolina needs to land in the 2024 recruiting cycle. The guys that they have yet to get a commitment from in this recruiting class. So we're going to start off with number three. And in this slot, I have offensive tackle Josiah Thompson out of Dillon High School in Dillon, South Carolina. And there's a few different reasons why I have Josiah Thompson listed here. Firstly, it's pretty simple. You can never have too many offensive linemen in the SEC. The Gamecocks, obviously, in terms of their efforts on recruiting the trenches, have really prioritized this area over the past 9, 12 months or so. They've added guys like Marky Anderson, Trevon Baugh, Jatavius Shivers, Oluwata Simbabalade, and Cam Pringle. And they could be adding more in the very near future. And Josiah Thompson is arguably potentially their top target remaining in this position group alongside Blake Franks out of Greenville, South Carolina. And that leads to my second point. Josiah Thompson is an in-state prospect, but most importantly, he is at a pipeline school for the Gamecocks in Dillon High School. And this means that besides his position and the talent that he possesses, South Carolina cannot afford to lose out on Josiah Thompson because this would be a blow to South Carolina's rapport with Dillon High School, firstly. And secondly, it would very much slow down the narrative on the team starting to lock down the state once again in terms of high school football talent. And with the lead that many people assume the Gamecocks have with Thompson up to this point, it would be looked as a real bad swing and miss if South Carolina were to not land him at the end of this cycle. And then the last reason why Josiah Thompson is a can't-miss prospect for the Gamecocks is the skill set that he offers. In terms of athleticism as an offensive lineman, Josiah Thompson is probably one of the best in the 2024 recruiting class. He's a kid that fires off the ball much quicker than most at his position. And he is a road grader in the running game. But he also possesses enough athletic and skill set traits for his position to be a potential solid pass protector at the left tackle position at the next level. So he's got the ability to be really good in both the running game and and passing game, and again, he's got a lot of athleticism to boot. That's not something that you see grow on trees quite often with offensive linemen. So Josiah Thompson, the third highest ranked can't-miss prospect for Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks. At number two, this is a new name that I have not mentioned yet on this show, and I'll give you all some quick context after I mention him. Wide receiver 
Parker Livingston out of 5A Lovejoy High School in Lucas, Texas. Now, for the context behind this prospect, Parker Livingston does have an offer from South Carolina, but the thing is, there was a report that came out back on February 20th from On3 recruiting analyst Sam Spiegelman, and the report by Sam basically was talking about how Parker is planning to take a bunch of spring visits to some schools that he hasn't really seen yet. And one of those schools apparently is South Carolina. The exact date, again, has not been finalized yet, but Parker has basically made it clear that he wants to make it on over to Columbia to check out the program in a much closer vantage point. So why do I have Parker Livingston slotted here at number two? Well, Firstly, this is a position of need, in my opinion, and many people's opinions, honestly, for this recruiting cycle. As I've mentioned countless times, I'll keep it short and sweet, the Gamecocks are expected or preparing to lose guys like Juice Wells, Xavier Leggett, Amarian Brown, on Joyner, Eddie Lewis, and also Trey Knox from the tight end position after 2023. That's a lot of receiving targets that you're going to have to replace quickly and in a hurry. And South Carolina's got to start doing that once again through the high school ranks. The second reason why I've got Livingston listed here. He has got a real impressive combination of both size and athleticism. He's listed six foot three to six foot four and between 185 to 190 pounds. And the thing is, South Carolina has got to get some more bigger body receivers on this roster. It's the main reason why I listed him here over Jonathan Paler, who's another big time receiver target out of North Carolina. And the other thing is, He's not just all size. Parker Livingston has got the athleticism to go along with it. He's got elite speed and acceleration. At one point in his junior season on a particular play, he was recorded running 22.5 miles per hour down the field. And he also happens to run track and field for the Lovejoy Leopards as well. And the other thing is this, he's got spectacular ball skills. He can go out there and snag footballs with one hand. He can catch footballs with a defender right on him, contorting his body and adjusting to the ball depending on where it is going. And he can also jump over defenders and catch the football, basically mossing them with his six foot three to six foot four frame. And the last reason why South Carolina would have a chance to utilize some connections here to make another sort of quote unquote shocking pickup, because here's the thing. This is a kid out of Texas. He's been offered by teams like Texas, Texas A&M, Baylor, LSU, Georgia, amongst many others. And so this is another opportunity for Shane Beamer and South Carolina's football coaching staff to add another feather to their cap by getting a recruiting win here in an area that sort of has not been a predominant spot in their recruiting base in years past. And they got Justin Stepp in on this recruitment. We've talked about it before. Justin Stepp is a relentless recruiter. He's a guy that really cares about building relationships with his targets, and he's always noted by the guys that he's going after as someone that they really enjoy talking to and the fact that he cares about more than just a football player. But Livingston's also got a prior relationship with offensive coordinator Dow Loggins from the time that Loggins spent at Arkansas, and this was all according to 24-7 Sports with their profile on Parker Livingston. So basically get to know the name Parker Livingston because this is a big time wide receiver target that we're going to need to pay attention to moving forward in this process. So those are the number three and number two can't miss prospects for Shane Beamer and South Carolina's football program in the 2024 recruiting cycle. Who is number one? We're going to dive into that and a lot more in some of the other major sports in just a couple moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, it's secure, and it's super easy to use. And you can bet on quite literally anything that you put your mind to, from the money line to point scores, maybe to three-pointers made in a basketball game. And FanDuel will let you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss out on your chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets 
when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Thank you for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen here today. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where you'll find everything you need to know about college basketball in just one place. Plus, you'll hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, so South Carolina's number one can't-miss prospect when it comes to football recruiting for the 2024 recruiting cycle is edge defender Dylan Stewart from Friendship Collegiate Academy in Washington, D.C. And again, multiple reasons why I have him slotted here. Firstly, this is probably the biggest position of need for South Carolina right this very moment because as we talked about again before on this show the Gamecocks are in a quandary right now with some veteran players who maybe haven't proven themselves to their fullest extent in the SEC or have dealt with some injuries in the past calendar year plus they got some highly touted freshmen who have already enrolled here on campus but they have not played a single snap of collegiate football up to this point and they're going to be relied on to make an impact almost immediately this upcoming fall. That's not exactly a situation as a coaching staff that you want to find yourselves in. So South Carolina's coaching staff, they've got to get some help here at this spot, which again means they need to dip into those high school recruiting rankings. They need to find a couple guys that they can have come in here and then allow them the opportunity to develop them and mold them. Dylan Stewart, based on the potential he offers as a power five pass rusher could be just that player. He's got really good athleticism in terms of his burst off of the snap. He's also extremely fluid in terms of his change of direction. He goes from running upfield to moving laterally within like a half second, and he makes it seem a lot more seamless than just about anybody else that plays his position in this recruiting class. And he's also got a very high motor in terms of pursuing the ball carrier from the opposite side of the field with plays that are run away from him. But the thing is, like Desmond Omeo Zulu, when he was playing some football up there in the DMV region at a private school this past year, he's got really solid technique to go with his athleticism. He's got solid bend when he's trying to create his pass rush lane as he's moving towards the quarterback. And he already understands the importance of subtle hand action in pass rush, trying to swipe away an offensive lineman's hands, finding little minute ways to create yourself some extra space and thus give yourself a little bit of extra time to get around your matchup. And he also breaks down in an athletic stance quite well while remaining patient in rush defense if a running play comes Dylan Stewart's way. The last reason why I think he is the number one can't-miss prospect for Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks is the fact that this would be another chance for Shane Beamer and the staff to further establish a recruiting stranglehold over the DMV region, which is Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. They've already landed a bevy of highly touted prospects out of this region. Guys like Nicholas Harper from National Signing Day, Desmond Omeo Zulu, and Oluwatisen Babalade. This is a strategy that has already yielded a ton of benefits for this football program, and I see no sign of South Carolina slowing down in that regard with the DMV region moving forward. So Dylan Stewart, the number one can't-miss prospect for Shane Beamer and this coaching staff in this cycle. Now that we've talked about some football recruiting, let's real quickly pan over to the women's basketball front as Don Staley and South Carolina's women's basketball team accomplished one of their bare minimum goals on Thursday night, clinching a share of the SEC regular season title by defeating the Tennessee Volunteers 73-60 to in a game where the Gamecocks produced a much more balanced and collective team effort on both sides of the ball, which led the way to a solid bounce-back performance after, again, they narrowly escaped 
against the Ole Miss Rebels this past Sunday. Against Ole Miss, South Carolina only had two players reach double figures in scoring. Zach Cook had 24 points, and Liam Boston scored 13 points in that respective contest. But against the Tennessee Volunteers, South Carolina had four Gamecocks reach double figures in scoring. Zai Cook had 19 points. Kier Fletcher produced 15 points. And Aaliyah Boston and Bill both ended up mustering up 11 points in their own right on Thursday night. This balanced performance was needed because of how the Volunteers played Aaliyah Boston, with Boston seeing double teams and triple teams at times went down on the low block. So South Carolina's guards had to adjust pretty quickly, and they got off to a pretty bad start. They were down 19-10 to at the end of the first quarter, but about midway from the second quarter onward, it was pretty much all South Carolina. Zaya Cook was a microcosm of this. She had zero points in the first 10 minutes of action, but halfway through the second quarter, she was a real spark on the offensive end for South Carolina. She got some open looks from behind a three-point line, and she hit a couple of those shots, which basically opened up some driving lanes, and Zia Cook took advantage of that by going to the basket and making some tough layups, going through contact. And then that ended up opening up some space in the mid-range for Zia Cook, coming off of screens, basically using some subtle hesitations and some stop-and-pop moves with her own ball handling. Zia Cook is one of those unique players that can basically open up every area of the floor for herself. And she wound up doing that on Thursday night against the Tennessee Volunteers, which again was desperately needed by that five minute mark in the second quarter when the Gamecocks were still down by, I believe, somewhere between eight to 10 points or so. Kiera Fletcher made a significant impact on Thursday night. She was being left wide open on offense at the beginning of the game, and she was quite hesitant to take any shots. But in the second quarter, here Fletcher sort of just decided, you know what, if you're going to give me this much space, I'll start taking some of these shots. And she was nailing them in the second quarter. She hit two three-pointers, one from each of the top wings on either side of the floor, and this gave her a boost in her confidence offensively. She started taking the ball more inside, and she also, like Zai Cook, hit some pretty sweet mid-range jump shots, a fadeaway, and again, some mid-range jump shots off some screens, some set plays written down by Don Staley and his coaching staff. So props to Fletcher for really showing up on this end as well. Aaliyah Boston, as I alluded to earlier, she had to pretty much earn everything that she got on Thursday night. Had a lot of physical play inside. Some of it seemed like it was a touch egregious, but that's a compliment to the abilities that she offers on the floor. She did manage to get things going in the second half in terms of creating some good shot opportunities for herself out of the low post. So again, not the stat line maybe that people would normally expect, but it wasn't without a really solid fight from Aaliyah Boston considering what Tennessee was doing to her on that end of the floor. Bree Beal, a great all-around performance by her. She made a presence felt everywhere on Thursday night. She struggled early, admittedly, because she missed a bunch of wide open three-point shots, but she adjusted to that. She started driving more to the hoop. She used her body to shield the basketball and was very crafty in creating her own shot, drawing fouls and getting to the free throw line. She was a menace on the boards. She was the only Gamecock on Thursday night to record a double-double. And she also made some good decisions on offense in terms of knowing when to get the ball to her teammates that were in an advantageous situation. She got five assists on that end of the floor. So... Essentially, with this balanced performance that South Carolina got out of their starting lineup on Thursday night, and being just four games away at most from the NCAA tournament, these are the kind of performances that South Carolina needs to see from their team going forward in order to have a shot to win their second straight national title. And against a team like Tennessee, I think that it was a really good precursor to how this team could end up rounding into form in March. All right, now let's switch gears and talk about South Carolina's baseball team and what they're going to be going up against this upcoming weekend against the Penn Quakers from the Ivy League. Now, I will say this. The Gamecocks have gotten off to a great start this season, and we all, of course, know this based on how they have won each of their first five games against UMass Lowell, Winthrop, and then Queens University from North Carolina. But... 
South Carolina cannot afford to sleep on the Penn Quakers. In 2022, Penn went 33-15 and with their win-loss record. And they won series on the road against teams like Texas A&M, College of Charleston, and also Winthrop in non-conference play. So this is a team that is not afraid to go down south and take on some of these more predominantly known teams in college baseball. And when you're talking about their team heading into this season, the batting lab returns five of their seven primary starters from this past season, including Wyatt Hensler, who batted 383 in 188 plate appearances and had an OPS of 1.184, just an astonishing high number, no matter what level of baseball you're talking about. And he also hit 14 homers to boot. This team, based on their stats from last season, has a gorilla ball approach at the plate. They can draw some walks every now and then, but this is a lineup that is willing to live and die by the long ball. This is going to be something in particular to watch with Will Sanders later this afternoon because if there's one sort of negative in Will Sanders' game, it's the fact that when Will Sanders is not completely locked in in terms of his command of his pitches, he has had a propensity since the start of last season to essentially throw some pitches right over the heart of the plate and basically allow some opposing batters to just clobber them out into the outfield and out of the park for home runs and and giving up a lot of solo homers, two-run homers every now and then. This is the kind of lineup that can make Will Sanders pay for that if he has that kind of game again later this afternoon. In terms of pitching, the Quakers have two solid starting options and bullpen options. With the two pitchers to mainly watch being Friday night starter or projected Friday night starter in left-handed pitcher Owen Coady and left-handed reliever David Shoemaker. In terms of the starter, Owen is a strike-throwing machine who, based on his 2022 stats, possesses excellent velocity and command of his pitches, posting a 1.13 whip, which is walks and hits per inning pitched in 2022, and he also possessed a 3.36 strikeout-to-walk ratio. Basically, he struck out three and a third batters for every walk that he had in 2022. So Owen Coady is going to be a pretty significant challenge for this South Carolina batting lineup on Friday afternoon. David Shoemaker, it seems that he pitches more so to contact based on his 23 strikeouts compared to 25 innings pitched in 2022, but he finished with a team low 2.16 ERA out of all the pitchers that pitched for more than five and a third innings this past spring for the Quakers. So the Quakers have some decent pitching options to go along with their gorilla ball batting lineup. So for South Carolina's batting lineup this weekend, Friday is going to be a battle, as I mentioned earlier, with Owens on the mound. And their patience is going to be tested to a much greater degree. It's easy to have plate discipline when you know that you're going to be facing pitchers that are going to have some issues with their accuracy, with their command of their pitches. But when you're facing a guy like Owen Coady, who again, based on his stats last year, seems to be a guy that has maybe some good action or good velocity along with good command, it's going to be interesting to see what the plate approach is like collectively from South Carolina's batting lineup. The emphasis is going to need to be waiting on the right pitch for these batters because if they can get to the Quakers pitching staff early and often this weekend, it could be another solid weekend for the Gamecocks, and who knows? I would not put it out of the realm of possibility that they could sweep the Penn Quakers, but if they don't do that, then it could be a much more significant challenge from the beginning all the way to the end. For South Carolina's pitching staff, the consequences for any flagrant misses with their pitches is going to be more amplified this weekend. Will Sanders, again, is going to be a pretty good litmus test to see just where this pitching staff might be heading into this series. And South Carolina's top relievers, guys like Kate Austin, Austin Williamson, Nick Proctor, Matthew Becker, Eli Jones, and the other guys as well, they're likely going to need to be leaned on to a much more significant degree this upcoming weekend. Because again, Penn's got multiple solid bats in their lineup, and guys that can hit the ball out of the yard. So needless to say, 
This is not UMass Lowell. This is not Winthrop. This is not Queens, North Carolina. And no, it's not an SEC opponent, but it is an opponent that, again, like UMass Lowell, was one game away from making it to the NCAA Regionals last season. And a team that went 33-15 and 15 a year ago. So, this is going to be a very intriguing matchup between South Carolina and Penn this upcoming weekend. And it'll be interesting to see how the batting lineup and pitching staff, again, adjust to this higher level of difficulty with the Penn Quakers. But with that being said, y'all, that is going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show, as always. Regarding football recruiting for South Carolina, who are your three can't-miss prospects for the Gamecocks in this class? Who do you think the Gamecocks need to land? Also, what were your thoughts on South Carolina's women's basketball team and their performance against the Tennessee Volunteers in clutching a share of the SEC regular season title on Thursday night. And lastly, for those of you who are going to be watching the series this weekend between South Carolina and the Penn Quakers, what are your thoughts on the series? Do you think that Penn is going to provide a much more difficult challenge for the Gamecocks? Let me know your thoughts, as always, down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube or if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app. You could shoot me a message at a line underscore SC on Twitter, and I'll try to respond to your message as quickly as I see it. And once again, don't forget to make Locked On College Basketball your second listen or watch now that you have watched or listened to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But once again, that does it for me on today's show. Have a great rest of your Friday and a fantastic weekend, and I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.